When initially approached by Cricket Australia to make this film, my immediate thoughts took me back to childhood and my first Ashes memory, which took place right here at the MCG. It was just pure theatre, and the emotion of the Ashes had me for life. It's about passion, rivalry, and the relationships on and off the field. You will hear raw and unique insight into four of the greatest series in history. 1974-5, 1981, 89 and 2005. Told directly from those closest to the action, the players. The angst over time between the aristocrats of England and the convicts of Australia, was that evident to you? Oh, look, it was a little bit, because I think it was sort of something that was passed on down through the generations of Australian cricket, to be fair, right the way back and listening. I didn't play with AB, but I know that he carries that around a lot. Even though we're cut from the same cloth in some respects, England still feel like they rule Britannia. <laughs> They think we are lesser, we're convicts, to put it blankly. They are regal, they are royal, and we are subservient. The great divide, the supposed divide of the privileged English and the underprivileged Australians sent 12,000 miles away to forge a future for themselves. These are reprobates uh, from England. They've done all sorts of ne'er-do-wells, uh, you know, bad lads. They will send them to Australia. Well, they never thought that through for a start. There's a million places they could have sent them to. They say of Australia, we, we want to go there. I get great delight in reminding the Aussies that we sent them down here. Beefy still carries on with that shit. They always had that air about them that they just strutted around like they invented the game, and they did invent most games. The trouble is they're not very good at winning at most. We had the chains around our ankles with the convicts, and they like to remind you of that all the time. The Aussies don't seem to be able to take the fact that you basically ask. It can be very funny. But I think deep down they really mean it. I love Australia. It's just ruined by those people that live there. There's always that, you're a pom, yeah, and you're a convict. The English love using that word. It's probably why I like using the word pom. <laughs> Which the Australians have got wrong, by the way, because pom stands for prisoner of Mother England. No, I think it's actually the other way around. We kind of run your place. We own it. We don't like them, so they don't like us. <laughs> Play on. <laughs> yeah. Tomo was the one who used to say, ah, oh, those bastards, they think they're better than us. It's that kind of chip on the shoulder thing. The Ashes goes deeper than just on a superficial sporting level. But we've probably got a lot to answer for, the English. <laughs> <laughs> My background's Scottish, so we always hated the bastards anyway. <laughs> um, the 
burning of a trophy. I might be wrong. No, that's wrong. They burn the bales or something, is that it? I shouldn't know that. I thought I played them. I think, is that it? Well, allegedly, it's to do with the bale being burnt by the players' wives. And now, how true that is, I mean, there's still this room about what actually is in that urn. Why did they burn the bales? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Why did they burn the bales? Oh, that's, a, that's an intriguing one. My understanding is some bits of wood being burnt. <laughs> yeah, that's, about, that's it. Well, look. It's, it's what I think it started years ago, but I'm not too sure why they burn them. And I'm a cricketing lover, and I've got no idea. How did cricket end up with this uh, little urn with apparently some cremated bales in there? They're trying to work out whether it was actually uh, the ashes of stumps or, or something else that, that, that were in there. It's probably made up some of it, <laughs> poetic license. If you try and tell me there's no, they didn't burn the stump. That's okay. I'm not going to believe you. La 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 la. Oh, I'm a believer. I, I haven't even thought. I haven't even questioned that. I don't want to. Why not? It's a great story. Well, to tell the story of the Ashes Urn, we have to go back to the summer of 1882. An Australian team defeated an English team in England for the first time. This was a, a real shock to the system. So much so that a few days later, a spoof obituary was placed in the Sporting Times newspaper declaring the death of English cricket, and that the body would be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. There was an English team going out to Australia that winter, captained by the Honourable Ivo Bly, and he declared he was going out to Australia to regain the ashes of English cricket. But before the first test match was even played, they visited Rupert's Wood House in Sunbury, Victoria, which was the home of Sir William and Lady Janet Clark. There, on Christmas Eve, Ivo's team played a scratch match against some of the estate workers, which they, of course, won. Now, Lady Janet was renowned as a bit of a humorist, and legend has it that she went upstairs at the end of the game, took what was probably a perfume jar or a cosmetic jar from her dressing table, burned a bale that was used in the match, placed the ashes in the urn and presented it to Ivo as the ashes of English cricket. The urn has become associated with the, the myth, the legend of the ashes that we know today. You go and look at it in Lourdes and it creates those emotions. And I still get goosebumps and the hairs on the back of your neck go up. And that to me, even now, still gets me. It's a lovely story, really, isn't it? And it could have happened. There's a little one upstairs. I treasure it, yeah. I look at it just about every time I go in there. I, I have a, a little touch of it, yeah. You look at this and you're looking at it and thinking, wow, where has this been? What has this done? The history and the people that have picked this up is just amazing to think. You feel that something for so, that means so much uh, to two nations. Uh, should be far bigger and more impressive. But it's a symbol, and it's a strong symbol. I defy anyone in any other sport to come up with a trophy that has more historical significance than that little urn. And it's Underwood bowling to Chapel, who plays a beautiful shot. This could be four. For me, the Ashes came alive with a little wireless radio under my pillow at an English boarding school. I wasn't allowed it, so I smuggled it. And then I turned it on after the lights had been turned out in the dormitory. And it was specifically Jon Snow and Geoffrey Boycott in Australia in 7071 under Raymond Illingworth. Jenna the batsman, and into that bouncer, and the ball goes away to extra cover. It went a long, long way. Jenna is on the ground, and Illingworth is with him, and the batsman looks to be in a bad way. Snowy had this great ability of getting a ball just short of a length to rear up at the batsman's throat. It's a very intimidating bowler, very accurate, and plenty quick enough. And Snow already has been warned by umpire Rowan for intimidation under Law 46. And a backer of Illingworth, but he is behaving not like an England captain, but more like the prima donna of a South American football side arguing with the referee. Lou Rowan really got up Snowy's nose, and he got up Illy's nose. Snow comes down to say hello to some of the fans at the Paddington end. Now look at this. One of the drunken ones grabs him, tries to assault him now, pulls him into the fence, 
and Snow tries to pull away. The spectator is pulled away by his friends and Snow goes away, followed by beer cans that are being thrown at him. I think John Soto, this geezer over here, keeps grabbing hold of me and abusing me, and then after that, Raymond Wolf sort of took them off the field. It was certainly a strain. Um, no, I think it, everything was an isolated incident. There's a lot of tension out there, and things just happen on the heat of the moment. It's tension all the five days, and I can assure you we're all very pleased when it was over. We were half thinking, wow, we're going to win a test match by default here. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. <laughs> In that drama, that theatre, we all grew up, really, with a cinematic vision of Australia, and the Ashes built that for me. Chappell, who plays a beautiful shot. This could be four. The first Ashes series of the 70s marked the beginning of many great careers. One was the Wacker as a test venue, where Greg Chappell debuted with a century. 70-71 was a bit of a watershed for Australian cricket. We'd gone a long time without winning. Rodney Marsh, Greg Chappell made their debuts. It was the start of a new era. Dennis Hooley played his first test match in Adelaide and got five wickets and we knew then well, Dennis Hooley's going to be one of the best bowlers of all time and he turned out to be so. Bill Laurie lost the job, one of the few of maybe only Australian captain to, to be sacked during a series. They uh, played us and so we lost 2-0. Okay, I think some of this criticism has been justified. Um, I think there could be criticism of my uh, batting because you're in the side to make runs but um, I still think I'm the best captain in Australia. I heard on the radio and then I went into um, Stacky's room and him and Ian Redpath were a bit upset. I don't know why you're upset, you're still playing. <laughs> I didn't agree with the fact that uh, the way they dropped him, you know, to not tell him. I mean, Bill had given tremendous service to Australia. He deserved at least to have been told. I'll probably get myself in trouble here, but I think the captaincy's overrated. A captain can make a difference, but if you haven't got any socks, you can't pull them up. How do you think Ian Chappell will go as captain? I'm quite sure he'll do well. I think he's um, been picked at probably the best time of your career to be picked when you're in form. And uh, Ian's a very straight cricketer and I'm sure, I wish him well and I'm sure he will do well. When I went home that night, I said to my first wife, Kay, the bastards will never get me that way. I was always going to get out before they got me. When Ian Chappell got Willie Thompson and Maxie Walker, plus a good batting side, well, I think he was a master captain. At that stage, England were on the wane, but they were still the best side in the world. When we played in England in 72, pitches were pretty flat. And they played some thrilling cricket. Lily was bowling furiously. They exchanged wins early. Then England got us at Headingley in the fourth match and thus retained the ashes. Bowling. It was the second test at Lords, though, which provided the signature moment. Bob Massey made history. And now, a new world record for Bob Massey. Bob, eight and eight in the first game. What did that feel like? Six days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was very pleasing to do well in the first game. I was very nervous before the game. But I think Lords had a little bit extra about it. That was the test match that proved to all of us that we could beat anyone if we played well. The protocol is that the, the Queen and the Duke come to meet the Australian team on the field at tea time on the fourth day. Because Massey gets 16 wickets, it's all over before lunch. We're starting to celebrate. Uh, they've rescheduled the meeting with the Queen and the Duke for five o'clock tonight. So we're keeping our eye on Marsh, Walters, Tabor, all the usual suspects, because we can't have any of the guys turning up pissed. But no one's keeping an eye on Dennis. He was a mad drink. He wouldn't drink for the five days of the test. And then as soon as the test was, he'd walk in, if there was a jug of beer, he'd just go on like that, and he'd tip it down. And I had the job of taking the Queen around, the Majesty uh, John Gleeson. How do you do, ma'am? Your Majesty Danasili. G'day. Oh, Jesus. Well, Dennis called me on the telephone. I remember it very vividly, actually, and said, uh, I knew that he'd been in trouble with fast bowling, and I knew that he had the stress fracture problem with the back, and he'd been given a period to recover. And he said, uh, I'm going to take a crack at this. I'm going to see if I can make it back. When Dennis Lilly suffered a major back injury early in 1973, it appeared that Australia's potential revival might stall. But little did the world know, of course, of a powerfully built young tearaway with a catapult action terrorizing district cricket. Geoffrey Robert Thompson was on the runway. I, at a very early age, found myself in Sydney Grey cricket. You know, a little boy from, from London who'd never been out of Willesden. And uh, there was these people called uh, Thompson and Plasco. And this is, you know, no bullshit. Most weekends we play it, we put somebody <laughs> in a stretcher or in a hospital or something like that. It was just, 
It was just carnage. Every other word was F, and what you doing here, little pommy, you know me, and, you know, you, I'm going to make sure you're on the first plane home, mate, you little twat. They were pretty scared shit to play us. I know that some blokes didn't turn up at club games. I'd rather hit them than get them out. I, I, I hated batsmen back then because they were keeping me on the field. All I did was realise what I wanted to do, and that's be the quickest bowler in the world. We weren't that fearful of Australia's attack. We thought that Lily wouldn't be the man he was after a back operation, how wrong we were. Seventies was, you know, full on. Flower power and love. And I've never seen shirts with collars like them and all different colours. They were horrendous. And flared trousers and perms. Oh, I thought I was the dog's bollocks walking about. Here we go. Yeah, and when you look at pictures now, good grief, you look a right prick. The 70s was a rebel times, a good economy and everybody loves sport. Dennis dressed a bit sharper than most of us. I had a mix and match. My mixing wasn't too good. I think back to when I played, and it's like a different boat. It's fantasy land. Ah, oh, so big. Oh, mate. Well done, Albert. No, no, the can run as quick as this thing. <laughs> so when we're leaving the UK, I've never been out of England, never. I've been to Wales, that were about as far as I got. And so this journey on this aeroplane, the biggest thing I've ever seen. And loads of people on an aeroplane smoking. There must be five or six hundred smoking. I don't smoke at all. You're coughing and wheezing, you get off, you're asthmatic. You can't play for weeks. Got off somehow in Darwin. Coming down the steps, and I don't, I don't know who I'm talking to, I said, crikey, these engines get hot, don't they? He said, that's not the engine, that's just the place. It was stinking hot. Seventy-four five was a shock. England didn't take John Snow and Jeffrey Boycott. No Jeffrey Boycott on that tour. I only got on that tour because Boycott didn't go. Tomo played against us for Queensland in the first warm-up match. And Greg Chappell said to me, he was our captain. He said, "Don't show him what you can do." He said, "Just, just play with them like cat and mouse." I showed him nothing. We're not that worried that he's going to play after what we've just seen. Well, they didn't know anything about me. They hadn't heard. They only knew Lily because he'd been over there two years before. And he said something like, I can step it up from that. Don't you worry, I can step it up from what you've just seen. And he did. Those poor poms. They come out here, they didn't know about Thompson. They must have got the shock of their lives. There's been no more controversial pitch preparation in the history of Anglo-Australian test matches than the one for this opening test of the series here at the Gabba. And there's this fellow like an old vest on, a pair of shorts and boots, and he's rolling and picking weeds and one thing or another. And then we got this civic reception at night to go and meet the mayor. It's the same fucking block. I said, he's a groundsman. This is him. There were suggestions that the pitch itself was a mud heap, that the game wouldn't go the full distance, and that the curator, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Alderman Clem Jones, was wrong in his method of preparation. Anyway, he's got his own stand now, hasn't he? The Clem Jones stand. That were him. Mike Deness, captain of England, is now in his first really tough international trial here in Australia. Our captain was Mike Deness, and he was quiet. Tactics were what I would call formulative. Uh, I'm out here not only as a, as a captain of the side, but I, I'm there primarily as one of the major batsmen who's got to get runs. The only uh, problem I had with Mike was he must have put on a lot of aftershave. And so he would have it on his hands, obviously, and at the end of the toss, I'd, whoever's won, I'd just shake hands with the opposing captain and say, good game, mate. And I'd always have to go back in the dressing room and wash my bloody hand, because it, it smelled of old spice. Wally Edwards facing Willis. A pitch at the Gabba prepared by the Lord Mayor was uh, sporty, to say the least. Ooh, well, that was a nasty one. But I guess I started the problem by bowling short at Wally Edwards. And then again, he was hit. We got a lot of bounces in that first innings. Greg looks as though he shortened his run and might bowl cutters. That's courtesy. Let's see what happens here. Lily, he's out. Yes, he is out. Dennis went and met him. 
And he said something like, now it's my fucking turn. <laughs> so, you know, game on. Worse something like you'll get your sunshine. <laughs> I suppose getting out on a bouncer from Tony Gregg didn't make me that happy, but uh, I suppose uh, they were testing us out and probably didn't realise that Thompson and myself were a fair bit quicker than their bowlers and that they were to, going to get a few back. I remember he grabbed me by the throat, we were going out to bowl. He wanted me to kill someone. <laughs> and I, I'm fucking, I'm sitting there and I thought, I can know you bowl quick. So we get out, I said to Max Walker, I said, you, you'll you be coming into the wind. Dennis has bowled about three or four balls and I suddenly thought, Ian, what are you doing? You've got a fast bowler here. Why aren't you giving him the new ball? So I said, Tang, uh, Tomo, you'll be down that end, you know. And Tomo, yeah, sure, mate, you know, and I'm sort of waiting for him to do some loosening up, some, no, no, none of that. I just went back, I threw down a marker, and I thought, shit, this looks all right. You know, I didn't run out there with a string and measure it and all this bullshit and make sure this is there and that's there. But that's basically what I did, running and go away. Rodney jumped up and it smacked into his glove. He said, Christ, that hurt. He said, but I love it. And the this time, his walk, he's out. And in the air, what says is he out? He's out. England, two for ten. And Thompson has two for four. And he'll fight on his bow. In a silly shirt unbuttoned down to his belly, chest, gold chain, big mo, big hair. Lily, Lily, Lily. Oh. Hey, this is like better than any storybook I read when I was a kid. And Bacchus, Rod Marsh. Oh. Wild, unpolished, aggressive, raw. It was almost like Anchorman cricket. Ron Burgundy would love to commentate that series, 74, 75. They had the Moes. They just seemed like superheroes to me and legends. And I think uh, the storm signals are up. I think uh, Lily has intimated to Greg what his intentions are. Lily to Greg. And that's four. It's only Greg. But different gravy, tall, handsome, good-looking, blonde, and sort of, look at me, I'm giving it this. He was outrageous. Oh, charisma, you know, buckets of it, overloaded with it. And that's four. And look at Greg now, signalling four for himself. He'd be there waving the for signal, it sort of antagonised the bowlers even more. A lot of Australians didn't like Tony Gregg because he was a winder-upper, a shit-stirrer. He was ex-South African, he was a palm, and he was one bloke that didn't back away, you know. He, he wasn't gutless, you know what I mean? He wasn't scared. They see him as the villain, and I imagine he's quite happy with that. And that could be his 100. It's wide of Walters. Walters coming around very quickly, and he can't get to it. There's his 100. All I've heard about the 74, 75 tour for 38 years was how Greggy made that 100. I got it. Every night we went for dinner, the time he took to uh, Lily and Thompson uh, bowling short, which was a very courageous 100, by the way. If we're going to beat Australia, I want to beat Australia with all their guns blazing. I don't want any Aussie to turn around to me and say, well, that is our second 11. And I've been honoured to play against probably one of the greatest opening partnerships the world has ever known. And uh, when you make runs against them, you can go and sit down in the dressing room and wipe your brow and, uh, and you can say, well, I've got runs against bowlers, which, uh, which are as good as anything that's ever been around. So that's satisfying from my point of view. I said, is there any danger you can actually try and get Tony Gregg out rather than try and knock his block off? He called us a pair of dickheads for fucking bowling short. Tell me, you're the biggest dickhead of the lot. You bowl the best Yorkers going around, you never even bowled one. And I said, if I can write, you know. And the next day I just did that and it did everything he said, smash him in the foot, bowled him out. Oh, bowled him. Yorked him, leg stump. Bowled, it's all over. Australia win by 166 runs. Thompson finishes this innings with six for 46. I think a lot of batsmen around the world thought that Tomo was a maniac who was out to kill them and that didn't do him any harm. I love bowling quick, so I love scaring shit out of you. If your knees start shaking when the Aussie quickie's coming up against you, you know that you're going to be a failure, and failure has no place in Ashes contests.
Now, the MCC team will have an additional player added to their party sometime in the next 24 hours. I think they need someone who has been here before, someone who plays fast bowling pretty well, and I'd suggest that Colin Cowdery might just be the man to do that. Two batsmen sustained broken hands in that Brisbane first test match. Hit him on the hand and he threw his gloves off. That must have hurt. Which meant that the 41-year-old Colin Cowdery was wheeled out to the whacker. English cricketing royalty, if you like. He were in his sleepers at home and he gets the nod, come out here. And Cowdery came to dinner with us the night he got there and we played snooker. I remember it so well. Colin really didn't know what he was up against. From what you've seen and heard about Jeff Thompson, do you think you can cope with him? It'll remain to be seen. In the Brisbane match, he had a little bit to bowl on, and then both he and uh, Dennis Lilly had a good match. Let's hope that's the last good match they have for the, for the series. <laughs> so we opened the batting together, walking down the steps. No helmets. If you could have said to yourself, what is the toughest thing, the harshest thing I can do to any batsman, bring him at age 41 out of the English winter onto the whacker to face Lillian Thompson. I mean, can you think of anything more difficult? Poor old Colin was padded up. He had like a, a bed mattress wrapped round him to protect his chest. He was probably the toughest one of the lot of them. And he walked out and I thought, Jesus, he's had a fair Christmas eat this bike. But I didn't realise he had all these towels and shit all around him. And give it come out, he looked like a pear. Mate, they were shitting himself. We've ducked and waved after a bit. Boom, boom, get out of the way, Oof. He comes down, he says, uh, well, this is rather fun. I said, I've been in funnier situations than this. He went to Paul Thompson, missed him, and it sort of hit him in the side. Uh, he's not well at all. And I went up to him for the first slip, and I said, Kipper, are you OK? He just looked at me in his typical understated English way. He just looked at me and he said, Ian, I'm a bloody old fool trying to hook this man. He was getting thumped upon Tom Owen and Lily all the time. And I actually said to Ian, take him off before he kills him. I never forget it. It was terrifying. And I mean, you really felt for him. My gosh, they were quick. I bowled him behind his legs because he was going across too far. The other blokes were run on that way. He was trying to get in behind. And we bowled him. And quite often you'd look, when a wicket fell, you'd be standing around the group and you'd look to the gate, you'd see, you know, Barrington, and you'd think, oh, shit, not this bastard for a day and a half again. And we look to the gate and Mike Deness walks through and Doug turns and he has a look and he says, ah, oh, not this bastard for another 20 seconds. Dougie was uh, a bit of an enigma, really. You wouldn't find a, a less sort of athletic guy, you know, he'd have his pack of cigarettes next to him in the dressing room and a beer straight after play. Australia, three for 180. Great Chapel facing Willis. And he's caught, dropped, yes, caught. Just before tea, Greg Chapel had got out. Greg Chapel is out for 62. Normally when two people cross, there's only the words bad luck and good luck exchanged. But on this occasion, Greg said, I got out so you get under in the last session. And I said, you wouldn't get out to give your mother a hit. True point, a beautiful shot, that's four runs. True mid wicket, that's four. He goes out after T, whack, bang, crash, he's whacking them everywhere. Through mid wicket, wide of the nest, straight through to the boundary for four. Comes to the last over, he's 93 not out, needs 10 off the last over to get his 100 in the session. Willis had bowled me a short one, the first ball that I faced, and I went to hook and I got the top edge. Over the head of the keeper, down to the fence, four runs to Walters. Not a very convincing shot. He'd been averaging four or five short ones and over, so I'll get a couple more before the end of the over. He never bowled me another short one until the final ball. Doug Walters, 97, here's the last ball of the day's play. Oh, I'm going to get you with this. You're going to sky a top edge. I was going to have a go, and I knew he would be, he'd be having a go too. He hit it, could be four. Magnificent shot, it's out of the boundary. A six, a six, Wilders 103. He's hit this flat and just walked off, 100 in a session. I said, everybody grab their drink into the bloody toilets and the showers and there's no one here when he comes in. I run off the ground thinking the boys might have the tops off a couple of bottles. I arrived to an empty dressing room. They were all hiding in the shower. He, he just walked in and sat down and pulled out a dairy. <laughs> and after about 10 minutes, nothing. So I said to the guys, well, this is a waste of time, you know. 
Might as well go out. He's just sitting there, having a smoke. Terry Jenner gets a beer, walks over, hands it to him, and he says, not before time, Twelthy. <laughs> Dougie Walters, he working for a company, I think they'll go Rothmans, yeah. he used to go to joke shops in Australia and you could buy fake packets of Rothmans fags with a firecracker underneath. Proper firecracker, boom! When they were out in the field, I'd go in to their room, I'd have about 10 packets of these things, and I'd all round the room. He was paranoid at the end of it. He's, he's picking, he wants a fag, you know, he'd go, boom, up and go. He'd not a clue who were doing it. Thompson to Lloyd. And hit badly there that time. Somebody at Tommy he said he could play me with his dick or whatever. I can, he obviously couldn't do that. I said he can't bat an eyelid because he was shit scared of me, you know. Lloyd's in a fair amount of pain. No, you just go down and see, oh, you're all right, mate, but he was, you know, 100 miles an hour, he's not going to be all right. But he's jagged back and hit me straight in the nuts. It must have hit the wrong place, and it split the box. My bits have shot through it, and then it's gone like that, ah, boom. <sighs> you, you have tears to me eyes. And I went down in instalments. It's that sickening, horrible, and it don't go away for ages. I've gone off and I'm having treatment. He said, here, I've got this pint pot full of ice water. I just sat there with me nudger in it for about an hour. Book of Arrow actually loaned me a ball mm. that, that's from the 74, 75 series. They actually think that could be the one. This is the ball, refurbed. I remember that, Cookaburra Turf, that's it. Yeah. Hey, that's a beauty. I wish I was a fast bowler. I'd have flipping. I'd have been right at him. He'd do some damage with that. Don't give that to Tomo. That prick owes me so much money because if I hadn't hit him in the balls, nobody would know who the fuck he was. All every, everyone ever remembers is me hitting him in the nuts and that's so he's got all these fucking jobs out of it. And I haven't received one cent. You can tell Tomo I'm indebted to him. It's the best delivery I've ever received. Tony Gregg, the six foot seven and a half inch South African born all rounder, might be enjoying the MCC tour more than his teammates. He's the tourist's top run getter and wicket taker. His test hundred in Brisbane started a battle royal between Gregg and the Australian pace man Dennis Lilly. If you took, you know, genuine rivalry out of test cricket, um, people wouldn't enjoy it. And then it's not really a game. I mean, we had to try and win, and they're playing to beat us. So if there's no real, you know, there's got to be a bit of needle about it. I mean, these are the real tests, aren't they? England, Australia. Chapel driving. The crucial fourth test match began in Sydney in sultry, overcast weather, with just a hint of thunderstorms around, possibly later in the afternoon. Yes, he's gone. Well, by Tony Gregg. Ooh, he's it on. Tony Gregg again. It's going nicely, is this game. It's, going, it's just going along with pleasant. Oh. I mean, he won't quit, Greggy. Not at all. He'd be arms and legs and coming in. And he's seen on the point, the elbow. He's probably on the elbow, I should think. And Keith Fletcher's at gully. Now, he's not content with just hitting DK. Fletcher, with his cap on, and he said, well, bow, Greggy, give him another. I thought, oh, God, no. That wasn't a really smart thing to say. In fact, the rest of the Englishmen were looking at him and saying, what the hell are you doing? I knew Dennis. Oh, he was filthy on him. Make a cruel comment, he's made one mistake, he's hit the wrong elbow. And then he, he kicked off, because when we came into bat, and he's coming like a steam train. Oh, he's caught. And the field caught behind, he's out. Boom, gone, boom, gone. And the New England captain, John Edridge, making his way to the crease. Dennis certainly broke John Edridge's ribs in Sydney. And that was a nasty one. Edridge didn't move there. He was actually captain as well because Dennis had dropped himself for that game. He was a pretty gutsy guy, uh, John Edridge. Unfortunate captain of England, uh, John Edridge, uh, only facing one ball before he retires. Hurt. Fletcher walked out, and you've never seen a bloke walk so slowly in his life. I could sense fear in everybody's eyes. And I remember I hit him right between the eyes. Like, it just hit like, like concrete. Like a bat, like clank. You see, Tim, straight on the badge, that crest was St George on his horse. <laughs> Jeff Arnold, 
who's in the rooms, he said, Christ, he's just knocked St George off his horse. <laughs> I couldn't believe he didn't drop. Normally they drop when I hit him, but he was out on his feet. Greg Chapman and I aimed him at me. We stood him now on the pitch and aimed, aimed him at me. Out. So as he's walking off the field, Lily gives him an absolute gobful again. <laughs> this, is, this is what used to go up. Nine for 228. And that is the end of the test match. It's not only the end of the test match, but Australia have regained the ashes. And I'll never forget it, still probably to my dying day. When Greg took the catch, Rodney turned around with his glove hand, he put out his hand, he said, we've got the bastards back, the bastards being the ashes. Um, you know, that, that, that just says it all to me, yeah. We had quite a few beers in the dressing room that night. We played cricket hard on the ground, but we enjoyed life off the ground. I'll be there until uh, the last bottle was drunk, don't worry about that. <laughs> We were howling like lunch whistles. We were full as a state school hat rack. The yes, Ashes is what cricket is all about, what it was meant to be and what it, what it always has been, what it always will be to me. We'd been turned over, we'd done get home. I thought I ain't going to play again, and they binned me straight away. I didn't get back in. John Harlan wrote, you were effectively shocked and shattered out of test cricket. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's about it. You yeah, got it bang on, yeah. It's that realisation, I'm not just good enough. I probably had the stuffing knocked out of me by the pair of them. I wasn't prepared for what was coming up. It rams it home to you that this is a passion and it's a tradition. And when you're part of it, you know, you, you can tell your grandkids and, you know, I was, I was there. We copped a lot of flack. The press guys basically portrayed it as us bouncing the crap out of them and abusing shit out of them, and that was the way we beat them. Clearly some weaker souls were bothered by it. There was certainly some scarring amongst the England batsmen. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, it really don't get you Tom O'Must. The word intimidation is a very difficult thing to define. I think there's been a tremendous number of bouncers bowled in this series. I think probably both uh, Australia and England have been culprits of doing it. And I think it's something that uh, possibly will be taken up in due course. Every little chink in your armour is discovered. And if you've got a weakness, the opposition will ruthlessly find that out. I think that we've got some sort of mutual uh, love-hate relationship going. Next time, we're going to beat the bloody pants off them. And cheers. Put me exactly where I am now, and uh, you know, here I am. 12 months ago, when you didn't even have a job, things have really looked rosy in the last 12 months. Well, haven't been all that bad. <laughs> I forget what I used to live like. When I wasn't playing cricket, I got away from it. I think I was quiet, I was never a big hit. You know, I don't want to give up what I got now. I just want to, you know, get better and better. When we beat the uh, Poms here in that 74 fight, we went to the first World Cup after that Ashes win. After England hosted the inaugural World Cup in 1975, the Ashes were again on the line in a four-test series. It was more of the same in the first test, after which Mike Dennis was axed as captain, and then Tony Gregg took over. Immediately, England found new resolve and played competitive draws in the three remaining matches. The series was thus determined by Australia's innings win at Edgbaston, where a young player named Graham Gooch experienced a very unfortunate debut. England got a bit of hammering, so looking for some young blood. I was selected to play for the MCC, scored 75 against Lillian Thompson, got the gig for the test match, which was a few weeks later. That was selected by the England selectors, one of which was Sir Leonard Hutton, arguably England's greatest batsman. He came up to me on the morning of the test, and he said, congratulations, you're playing against Australia, the old enemy. And he turned to me and he said, um, Graham, he said, have you ever played against Australia before? So I'm quite bold, I said, yes, Len. I said, you selected me for the MCC two weeks ago at Lords. He said, did I? He said, I don't watch much cricket these days. There wasn't a great confidence booster on the first morning of the test. And he's caught off a thing deflection down the leg side, and Gooch 
sadly in his first innings for England, third ball. Oh, what a good delivery. A very sad moment for Graham Gooch, a pair. It's quite convenient to have your first test score in your surname. So you might get that one in. <laughs> In March 1977, a hundred years of Ashes cricket was celebrated with a test match of mystical aura at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. And away it goes again, beautiful shot. And that's it, it's LBW, Alan Knott is out. Lily has struck again to finish off this test match and Australia triumphing by a margin of 45 runs. By the most astonishing coincidence, it's exactly the same margin as Australia won the first Test match by in 1877. But as this remarkable cricketing event proceeded, the game's greatest upheaval was being hatched. Eight weeks later, the cricket world learned of the Packer Revolution. Most interest today was on the mechanics of the series. 51 top cricketers signed up. Kerry Packer foreshadows not only an Australia versus the rest of the world series, but possibly a series against the West Indies as well. The timing was right for Kerry Packer in that uh, the game had become immensely popular and clearly that interested him and he was wanting exclusive television rights. And it had become popular on the back of this bunch of rock and roll star Australian cricketers. All the contract cricketers will be operating under a new styled control body, a board of professional cricketers with its own chairman. All around the world, the boards of control were treating their players like serfs. It was the feudal system. They were paying them nothing. Something had to give, a revolution had to happen. And it had to be someone like Kerry Packer, who was essentially, well, he was a bully, and nothing was going to stop him, nothing. What will be his attitude if there are reprisals by cricketing authorities against the contract players? Oh, much harder. What, what is left? Uh... Well, I could put on a test match against every Indian test match right in the same city to start with, couldn't I? I could take those people over to England and I could play super tests over in England. I mean, if they victor, they can say what they like about me. If they start to victimise the players who've placed their trust in me, at that point in time, it's an all-out scrap. He offered the Australian board a great deal more money than the ABC, and they turned him down absolutely flat. They offered a brick wall, yeah. which, as we all know, Packer trampled on. Test attendances have fallen dramatically since the last tour here by England. According to the West Australian Cricket Association, cricket lovers stayed away because the Australian team was new and the public didn't know them. As one spokesman put it, it lacked the luster of a lily. I noticed that the Australians are in the dressing room watching the test match from Perth. Does it burn you up a bit that uh, you're not over there playing for Australia? Would you like to have a go at Randall and boycott and so on? Any Australian worth his salt would love to be. I love the situation to get together again as much as anyone else. Right from the outset, we knew there was going to be uh, a big stir up. We knew there was going to be uh, a lot of people who were very anti what we were doing. But I think perhaps in a few years' time, people will look back and say, well, you know, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle around about 1978, but uh, it all worked out pretty well and look what a great game we've got now. As far as the Ashes were concerned, it affected 77 in England because Australia was a distracted and perhaps divided team and was smashed. But then in 78-9, Graham Yallop, hopelessly inexperienced and ill-equipped for the task, uh, has to lead this team. I'm grateful for World Series cricket because it gave me an opportunity that I mightn't have received. There's so many players out of the system, players like myself were fast-tracked on the back of N not a lot of performance. 78, 79, a lot of people say, well, Australia were weak. The majority of their best players were at World Series cricket. Sure, it was weak to beat them, but we knew we weren't playing the, uh, the best side. And we won that 5-1, that was a great thrill. It was a difficult period because everyone was looking over their shoulder waiting for the selectors' knives. It wasn't a great dressing room, you know, I've been in better. Aggression is one of those qualities that we come to expect in a sporting hero. But sometimes that aggressive nature isn't just confined to the playing field. And then the hero can land in a lot of trouble. Oh, it's stupid, really. Just a silly little argument that got out of hand. I came out to Melbourne University on a Whitbread scholarship. That's my real time with Australians, first time. 
I know there was a confrontation with Ian Chappell. We heard stories of blows being exchanged in the bar at the Melbourne Hilton. I was certainly baiting him about the game the next day and uh, at some stage or other he just shoved this empty beer glass in the face and said, I'll cut you from ear to ear. I don't uh, really think that uh, I'd need a beer glass to take care of Ian Chappell. You didn't do that? No, not at all. If he ever apologised for the lies that he's told, I would acknowledge that. Maybe he needs to grow up and let go. He then wanted to go on with the fight and uh, I said no. Well, I only think what he, he only got what he deserved. I think Ian Botham's one of the more boring human beings on this earth. Uh, it's the biggest embarrassment of my whole fucking life. It's annoying. You can't have them both together in the same place because of a stupid feud that's going on. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I think he's in a time warp and uh, that's fine. You know, if he wants to continue to talk about the Invincibles, his team and baseball, well, yippee, get on with it. Right now, you are leading our news board and uh, with an alleged fracas with Ian Beefy Botham and yourself in the car park. Um, are you aware of that? Well, uh, there were some words spoken in the car park. Um, I'm apparently being painted as the instigator. I'd, I'd accept 50% of the blame, but certainly not the instigator. I was there in that compound where it... That's it. That's it. Settle it here and now. And Chappelle is lent on the combi. And I'm watching all this. Beefy's chucked his jacket in the combi. Right, we'll settle this here and now. And Chappelle, ah, oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> They're two stubborn people. I hope before they um, go wherever they're going to go um, that they do sort of kiss and make up. Go on, boys, kiss and make up. I suppose what it does do is, in, at a personal level, reflect the Ashes contest. This is Australia against England. You've got two guys who will not take a backward step and you have longevity. This has gone on almost as long as the Ashes itself. It's Paul Mortimer.